Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the previous session, we were discussing the hearts of the ancient Israelites and how Allah describes their hearts as becoming so hard that it did not even sink in the fear of Allah. So now having described the behavior of the ancient Israelites and the main characteristics that made them very similar to Iblis, what you can see now happening in the surah is that it shifts to discussing the case of present day Jews, in particular, the Jews that were there at the time of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in Medina. In other words, the question that Allah is now going to address is that if the ancestors were greedy, ungrateful, they violated Tawheed and they loved to challenge Allah's commands, what about the case of present day Jews? What about the case of the Jews who were there in Medina at the time of the Prophet? Were they doing the same thing? Or is this just characteristic of their ancestors? So in verse 75, Allah says, Do you have hope, O believers, that they will believe in you? While a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then distorted it after they had understood it while they were knowing. Now many of the Arabs in Medina were very confused at the response of the Jews to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And the reason for this is because Jews at that time were considered by the Arabs to be a very literate nation in the sense that they had always received so many messengers and books that the Arabs believed that Jews had a lot of knowledge regarding Allah's message. Moreover, when Jews migrated and settled in Medina, they kept informing the local Arabs that a messenger would be coming as prophesied in their books. And this is really important because at times what would happen is that the Jews and the Arabs would have a lot of fights. And every time when the Jews would lose, they would warn the Arabs and let them know that our final prophet is coming. It's mentioned in our books and when he comes, then we will have the upper hand and we will easily be able to defeat you. So of course, when the messenger did arrive as prophesied, the local Arabs could not understand why the Jews denied him even though he was propagating the same message as was present in the Torah. So as a response to this confusion, Allah explains the transgressing behavior of the Jews in Medina, just like he described the transgressing behavior of their ancestors. But this time, there's a difference in Allah's strategy. In the case of the ancient Israelites, Allah would narrate the multiple cases of transgression, and then he would tell us the punishments that he gave them. But in the case of the Jews in Medina, after narrating their transgressions, Allah provides a logical argument, forcing the Arabs and the Jews to reflect. Punishment is now being withheld, because as mentioned before, the Jews in Medina had not witnessed the same kind of miracles as their ancestors. And this is why Allah had a very lenient approach towards them. Therefore, Allah continues to admonish them while the doors of Tawbah are open, Punishment is now reserved for the Day of Judgment. Now the first charge that is being made against the Jews was that they love to distort Allah's commands and they love to hide the truth. This is explained with multiple examples provided from verses 76 to 86. So while the ancestors would love to challenge or mock Allah's commands, their descendants, in other words the Jews in Medina, they went a step further by making alterations to Allah's commands. They distorted Allah's books in their attempt to prevent their own people from embracing Islam. And of course, in doing so, they would argue that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not a prophet because he was not bringing a message that was identical to the message in their own books. Because don't forget, at that time, there were many naive Jews as well. They were Jews who were listening to the message of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they did start to believe that he seems to be saying the same thing that was said by Hazrat Musa salam, and Hazrat Ibrahim salam, so he must be a prophet. So in order to ensure that the naive Jews do not embrace Islam, their scholars would make distortions to their own Torah, and then they would confuse the naive Jews by telling them that our books give a message that is very different to the message being given by this man, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so he cannot be a messenger. In doing so, they were concealing the truth and not just mocking Allah's commands, not just challenging Allah's commands like their ancestors, they were going one step further and they were actually making distortions to Allah's commands. They were changing it. Now, of course, you can imagine when some of the more learned Jews 
the rabbis and the scholars, when they start to make claims that the message being given by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the same message as is in their books, this does raise some kind of speculation and confusion regarding the legitimacy of the Qur'an. Because you have a lot of Arabs at that time who would look towards the Jews and they believe that, okay, the Jews are extremely literate. So they have all the knowledge because God sent them so many prophets and so many books. If the Jews are telling us that this man is a prophet, then he must be a prophet. And if the Jews are telling us that this man is not a prophet, then perhaps he just isn't. So because this was raising doubt and confusion, Allah is now providing a counter argument, encouraging the Muslims to reflect. If history has revealed that the ancient Israelites were characterized by rebellion and transgression, spanning centuries, can it not be expected that their descendants will behave in the same way? Given the history of Bani Israel, why were the Muslims confused at the reaction of the Jews and Christians towards Muhammad, peace be upon him? This is what they've always done. For example, if a child is raised in a family known for lying and deceiving, can it not be expected that the child will grow up to lie as well? Yes, he can change himself, he can learn from his mistakes, but initially it would be normal to expect that the child will exhibit the same traits of his family members because that is what he has seen all his life while he was raised. Imagine then the case of the Jews who had witnessed generations of lying, deceit and ingratitude because this is something that their ancestors had always done. So would it not be normal to expect the same initial reaction from the Jews in Medina? So you can see that Allah is providing a counter argument now. He is intervening and providing an argument to make sure that the polytheist Arabs as well as the Muslims don't get confused by the reaction of the Jews. Right? So now he's giving them an argument and making them reflect and understand that this is characteristic of the Jews. This is how they have always behaved. So don't let this cloud your judgment. Then in verses 76 and 77, Allah says, And when they meet those who believe, they say, We have believed. But when they are alone with one another, they say, Do you talk to them about what Allah has revealed to you so that they can argue with you about it before your Lord? Will you not reason? But do they not know that Allah knows what they conceal and what they reveal? Now what this verse means is that there were some Jews who would listen to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and to the Muslims. And when they would hear the message, they would say, yes, we do believe as well. In other words, you all are talking about Tawheed and we believe in Tawheed too. You are talking about the same message that is there in our books. But then as soon as they would go back to their learned Jews, to the scholars, and they would share all of this information with the scholars, the scholars would get angry at them. And they would sternly rebuke them, telling them, do not share the stories that are in our books with the Muslims. And this again makes a lot of sense, because the more that Muhammad, peace be upon him, would share knowledge and information, the Arabs would turn towards the Jews and ask them that, okay, he's saying this, are all of these things in your book as well? And if the Jews tell them, yes, the exact same message, the exact same stories are in our books, that just provides proof against the Jews. Because then the Arabs will be asking the Jews that if everything is the same, why are you not accepting him? In fact, they're providing an open testimony against themselves. And plus, this will also make a lot of the Arabs realize that, okay, this man has to be a prophet, so we should embrace Islam. So the learned Jews, in other, in other words, the scholars or rabbis, they instructed their own people that do not share the contents of the Torah with the Arabs or with the Muslims because you will only be providing proof against yourself. Unfortunately, the local Arabs were not very well rehearsed in the Hebrew language, so they could not read the Old Testament themselves to confirm that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was bringing a message that was exactly similar to the message received by the previous Ummah. In fact, by planning to conceal the truth from the Muslims, the Jews failed to realize that nothing can be concealed from Allah. He will hold them accountable on the day of judgment for hiding the truth and everything that they're trying to hide, Allah will actually reveal it through revelations in the Quran. Every story of their ancestors that they're trying to hide, Allah will reveal it in the Quran. You cannot hide anything from Allah. Then in verse 78, Allah says, And among them are unlettered ones who do not know the scripture except in wishful thinking, but they are only assuming. Now, there were three main influential Jewish tribes that were there in Medina at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
and these three Jewish tribes were called Banu Koreza, Banu Nadir, and Banu Kainuka. Now, although they appear to be Arabized Jews, and Arabized Jews means that they were Jews who were descendants of Bani Israel, but because they were living in Arabia, they started to speak Arabic. That's, that's what it means to call them Arabized Jews. So although these Jews, Banu Kureza, Banu Nadar, and Banu Kainuka, they appear to be Arabized Jews, this verse in the Quran suggests that perhaps some of them were just Arabs practicing Judaism. They were not actually Jews. They were not actually descendants of Bani Israel at all. They were just local Arabs who decided to practice Judaism. And they were calling themselves Jews, but they lacked knowledge of the Hebrew language and were absolutely oblivious of Allah's message in the Hebrew Bible. So they had no idea what was in the Old Testament. They had never read the Old Testament. The Old Testament was in the Hebrew language, and they did not even know how to read Hebrew, but they were calling themselves Jews. And they were proclaiming that they were following Judaism when in reality they had no idea what was in the Torah. That's why Allah says that some of them were unlettered. Some of them were not literate at all. They did not know what was in their books. And whatever they were proclaiming was just wishful thinking. So in other words, these were Jews who at times would go in front of the Arabs and they would claim that the message of Muhammad, peace be upon him, has nothing to do with the message that is there in the Torah. And then they would claim what is in the Torah, but it was just wishful thinking. They were just coming up with their own stories, their own ideas, their own conjectures. They had no idea what was in the book. So from this, we can understand that there were two kinds of problems. There were those Jews who were genuinely from Bani Israel. But the problem was they did not want to reveal what was in their books. So they started to distort the message or they would refuse to share the message. And then on the other hand, the other problem was there were some Jews who were not Jews at all. They were just Arabs who were practicing Judaism and they were coming up with their own ideas, their own stories of what they believed was in the Torah in order to spread confusion so that the other Arabs would start to think that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is bringing a message that is very different to the message brought by Musa salam in the Torah. Allah now again, as you can see, he's intervening and he is explaining the reality of everything so that the Muslims understand what's actually going on. And so this is yet another example of how the Jews love to mock Allah's commands, make alterations to it, make changes to it without fearing God. Then in verse 79, Allah says, So woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands, and then they say this is from Allah, in order to exchange it for a small price. Woe to them for what their hands have written. Woe to them for what they earn. Now, since the rabbis, in other words, the scholars of the Jews, since they saw the arrival of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a direct threat to their status, therefore they were willing to alter the words of Allah in their books in exchange for a small price, for a small benefit. And what is that benefit? The fact that they will be able to temporarily hold their power and reinforce their superiority over Bani Ismail. That's it. So just to maintain their status, just to maintain their superiority over Bani Ismail, they were willing to exchange Allah's words. They were willing to make alterations and tell their people or tell the Arabs that this has come from Allah. When in fact it was not from Allah, it was something that they had written with their own hands. In fact, the entire purpose really of sending the Qur'an was to inform people about the distortions made in the previous books and to provide the correct interpretation of events. In fact, just to give you an example of the kind of distortions that the Jews would make and how hard their hearts had become to the extent that they had no fear of Allah, the Jews in their books actually attributed huge sins such as adultery, zana, and idol worship to their own prophets. For example, in the Old Testament, it actually claims that Suleiman committed the crime of apostasy. In other words, he left Islam and he started to worship idols just because of the love that he had for one of his wives. So they have the story where one of his wives started to worship idols and because he loved that wife so much, he started to worship idols. Similarly, when you study the Torah, that even mentions that Harun was the one who helped the Jews build the cow in the first place, sort of encouraging the Jews to worship the cow while Musa was in Mount Sinai for 40 nights. 
So you can see these are huge crimes that the Jews have attributed to prophets. And the Quran clears all prophets of such crimes because Allah keeps reiterating that all the messengers of God were excellent role models for mankind. All of them followed Tawheed. None of them committed the kind of crimes that are being mentioned in the Old Testament. Then in verses 80 onwards, it says, and they say, never will the fire touch us except for a few days. Say, have you taken a promise with Allah? For Allah does not break his promise. Or are you saying something about Allah, which you don't even know yourself? Yes, whoever earns evil and his sin has encompassed him, those will be the companions of Jahannam. They will abide therein forever. But those who believe and do good deeds, they will be companions of Jannah. They will abide therein forever. So again, the fearless attitude of the Jews and their ancestors towards Allah centered around the concept of the chosen nation and this belief that no matter what happens, they will be able to go into Jannah. So this is yet another example of how they're making this outrageous claim about Allah, which Allah has never mentioned. And so Allah is now intervening and telling the Muslims that talk to the Jews, ask them, where is this written in your books? Where has Allah made this promise with you because Allah never breaks his promise? Or is it that you are making a claim about Allah, which Allah has never made? In contrast over here, you can see Allah keeps emphasizing that on the day of judgment, all that's going to matter is faith and good deeds. Every single person is going to be held accountable and no one is going to be given beneficial or preferential treatment. Then in verses 83 onwards, Allah says, And recall when we took the covenant from the children of Israel, and joining upon them, do not worship anyone except Allah. And do parents do good, and to relatives, orphans, and the needy do good. And speak to people good words, establish prayer, give zakat. Then you turned away except a few of you, and you were refusing. And when we took your covenant saying, Do not shed each other's blood, or evict one another from your homes, then you acknowledge this while you were witnessing. Then you are those, the same ones, who are now killing one another and evicting a party of your people from their homes, cooperating against them in sin and aggression. And if they come to you as captives, you ransom them, although their eviction was forbidden to you. So do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part? Then what is the recompense for those who do that amongst you except disgrace in this life? And on the day of judgment, they will be sent back to the severest of punishments. Allah is not unaware of what you do. Those are the ones who have bought the life of this world in exchange for the akhirah. So the punishment will not be lightened for them, nor will they be helped. Now, just as the ancestors were guilty of transgressing the commandments given to them, their descendants, in other words, the Jews in Medina, were guilty of the same crime. They were told to do good, to speak the truth, to help other people, but instead they concealed and distorted the truth and they only spread evil. In fact, the Sharia given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, was very similar to the Sharia of the Jews. And in this regard, it is impossible to conceive that the Jews could not identify the message brought by Muhammad, peace be upon him, as being from the same God. It is impossible to even conceive that the Jews just got confused because the Sharia given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, is very similar to the Sharia given to Musa salam. Now these verses give a further example illustrating how the Jews would challenge or make fun of Allah's commands just like their ancestors. And their rabbis, or in other words, their scholars would just silently ignore this behavior. And this can be seen in verses 84 to 86. Before the arrival of Islam, Medina was dominated by two main Arab tribes, the Aus and Khazraj. Now, Khazraj was considerably larger than Aus, and the Jewish tribes that were in Medina, in other words, Banu Kureza, Banu Kainuka, and Banu Nadir, they had formed allies with these tribes. In particular, Banu Kainuka had formed allies with Khazraj, Banu Nadir and Banu Kureza had formed allies with Aus. So as a result, whenever the two Arab tribes, Aus and Khazraj, whenever they would fight amongst themselves, their Jewish allies would join in to support them. And this would result in Jews fighting Jews on the battlefield, which of course is a huge crime. And it was specifically mentioned in their books in the Torah that they cannot be killing each other. 
Then furthermore, when captives would be taken at the end of the battle, Jews would pay ransom for their own captive brothers, which was commanded in their books, even though they were prohibited from fighting and banishing them in the first place. Now let me just explain that further. Imagine Aus and Khazraj are fighting. Now Banu Kainuka is allies with Khazraj. Banu Nadir and Banu Kureza are allies with Aus. So when Aus and Khazraj start fighting, Banu Kainuka starts fighting with both Banu Nadir and Banu Kureza. Now what that means is that on the battlefield, there were Jews from Banu Kainuka who were fighting with Jews from Banu Nadir and Banu Kureza. And then furthermore, when the battle would end, so let's assume that there was a battle and it ended, and Khazraj won. Now, if Khazraj and Banu Kainuka, if they both have won, then they would take over the land of the enemy, which means that they would force people from Banu Nadir and Banu Kureza and Oz tribe to be banished from their land. So when you take over the land of the enemy, then of course you will kick out the enemy. So a lot of these Jews and Arabs from Banu Nadir, Banu Kureza and Oz, the party that lost the battle, they would be banished and many of them would be taken as captives back to Khazraj and Banu Kainuka. Now at that time when Jews would see that another fellow Jewish brother has come to them as captives, then they would feel bad for him. They would offer money to ransom him themselves so that he could gain freedom. And this, of course, is a command that is mentioned in the Torah, that if a Jewish brother were to come to them as a captive, then they should ransom him and grant him freedom. So that part of the Torah, they were adhering to. But the other part of the Torah, which mentioned that you're not supposed to banish and fight with your Jewish brothers in the first place, that part they were simply ignoring. So this is what Allah is saying over here, that they're making a complete mockery of Allah's commands. They ignore those commands which conflict with their personal interest and they follow only those commands which are very well aligned with their interests. In other words, at this time in Medina, building alliances with the Arab tribes was more important for the Jews in terms of personal security than following Allah's rules. So the Jews decided to help the Arabs fight against each other and they were willing to breach the divine law by killing each other on the battlefield only to later pay ransom to free their captive Jewish brothers as a means of hopefully pleasing God. In fact, at this stage, it is possible to draw a great similarity between the actions of the Jews prior to the arrival of Islam and the action of the Jews after the arrival of Islam. And this is where you can see that just by mentioning these verses, Allah is not just telling the Jews where they're going wrong, but there is a hidden message in this for the Jews, a hidden warning. As mentioned previously, Jews in Medina were making alliances with the polytheist Arabs like Aus and Khazraj, and they were harming their own brothers in the process. Now, after the arrival of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Jews should have included the Muslims as their brothers in faith. Because the Muslims not only believed in the Torah, but the Muslims also believed in all of the prophets sent to the Jews and the Christians. So the Jews at that time should have actually considered the Muslims as their brothers in faith. Both of them were following one God. Both of them were practicing Tawheed. But instead of protecting the Muslims, the Jews resorted to attacking them by making alliances with the Quraysh. So as you can see, by doing this, they repeated the offense by making alliances with the polytheists in order to harm their own brothers in faith. And this is what Allah is saying, that you did this before, and now with the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you are doing it again. Then in verse 87, Allah says, And we did certainly give Musa the Torah and followed him up after that with many messengers. We gave Isa, the son of Maryam, clear proofs and supported him with a pure spirit. But is it not that every time a messenger came to you, O Bani Israel, with what your souls did not desire, you were arrogant? And then a party of messengers you denied and another party you killed. Now the second charge that is being made against the Jews in Medina was that they were ungrateful. Unlike the unlearned Arabs who had never received a prophet, the Jews had many books that comprised of the Old Testament, with each book explaining the teachings of the prophets sent to them. With all of that guidance, they chose to still deny a message that they could clearly identify as one being sent from the same God. Instead of guiding the unlearned polytheist Arabs 
they chose to spread confusion, taking advantage of the fact that many Arabs considered the Jews as being wise and knowledgeable and literate. So following the footsteps of their ancestors who challenged their prophets every time a command was sent, instructing them to do something against their will, the Jews in Medina did the same thing. They denied the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was sent during their time. They strove to execute him. They wanted to destroy Islam. And by doing all of this, they were simply revealing their ingratitude for all the guidance, the prophets and books that Allah had sent them. In other words, all that guidance that Allah gave them was not so that they could use it to go against the final prophet. All of that guidance that Allah gave them was so that they would have knowledge to recognize the final prophet and that they should be leaders guiding everyone else to the final prophet. But instead they took advantage of their books and all the prophets. They took advantage of the fact that the Arabs looked up to them and they used that to confuse the Arabs. So now consistent with Allah's methodology, Allah now provides a counter argument, encouraging the Jews to reflect. If they disbelieved in Muhammad peace be upon him because he belonged to the descendants of Ismail and not Isaac, then why did the Jews disbelieve and disobey their own prophets as well? In other words, if the Jews were saying we will not accept Muhammad, peace be upon him, simply because he is from Bani Ismail, then why is it that they even chose to disbelieve and disobey their own prophets who were from Bani Israel? For instance, if you read the Old Testament, Prophet Micah criticized the income inequality that existed amongst the Jewish tribes, with some being very rich and some being very poor. And he criticized it and said, this is wrong. It's not a part of Islam. In fact, he also strongly condemned all the priests and the judges who would accept bribes to alter the scriptures or the rulings. So therefore, the Jews went against him. Prophet Isaiah, he was also up from Bani Israel. He was murdered by the Jewish king Manasseh at that time because the prophet accused the king and all of the other Jews of transgressing the commands of God. Similarly, attempts were made to kill Prophet Elijah for showing miracles to prove that the deities and the idols that some of the Jews started to worship were actually wrong and powerless. And then, of course, we know Isa, salam. he was sent to Bani Israel and he strongly condemned the rabbis for their misrepresentation of Allah's religion, for making distortions, and the rabbis charged him with blasphemy. Moreover, as an attempt to give a logical explanation for the miracles he could perform, Isa salam, was accused of being possessed by demons. So in other words, just to make sure that nobody pays attention to Isa salam, the rabbis went to the extent of accusing Isa salam, of blasphemy. They made accusations that Isa salam, is calling himself God or he's calling himself divine when at no point did Isa salam, make any such claim. And at the same time, because he could perform so many miracles and the people were confused at why he could, he could perform miracles, the rabbi suggested that Isa alayhi salam could perform miracles because he was possessed by a demon. So Allah is now reminding them of all the prophets he sent to them with the same message. Not only were the ancestors ungrateful by ignoring prophets, but their descendants, the Jews in Medina, were now repeating the offense. Because Allah has now sent them a final prophet to guide mankind. Instead of being grateful to Allah for this act of mercy by sending a prophet, they chose to deny that prophet and extinguish his message. So inshallah we'll stop over here, but I want you again to now reflect on the behavior of Bani Israel and make comparisons with the way that we are now behaving as an ummah. To what extent can you see a similarity between both of us? If the Jews have been accused of being ungrateful, are we as a Muslim Ummah not ungrateful? If the Jews were accused of making distortions to Allah's commands, picking and choosing which command they will follow, which they will ignore, as an Ummah, are we not doing the same thing? If the Jews were accused of concealing certain things that were mentioned in their books, or simply not knowing what was in their books, are we as an Ummah not doing the same thing, where many of us don't even know what's in the Quran? Or at times we do know, but we just choose to ignore it. We choose to conceal it. This is what Allah is telling us, that do not follow the characteristics of the Jews because then a time will come when our hearts will become so hard that it will not sink in the fear of Allah. Assalamu alaikum.